Welcome everyone, Jason Hoppe here to walk you through some very common terminology that we use in printing and print production. Now, all of these items here under the printing terminology infographic that I've created may make a lot of sense. And you may hear these words or these phrases used, but may not know exactly what they're referring to. So I'm going to walk you through each and every one of these items and get in depth into each and every one, what they do, what they mean, how they're used and show you examples. So let's get started. Live trim and bleed. Live trim and bleed is something that we deal with in all types of print. Now, what is live? What is trim? What is bleed? When we're printing something, we may have content that is on our page or in our layout. Anything that is going to touch the edge of the paper needs to bleed off the edge, which means once we trim this piece of paper, anything in terms of image or graphics, or in this case, lines, needs to extend beyond that edge. The live area is the safety inside so we don't get things too close to the edge to be trimmed off. So here we have it. Our trim size. This is the actual size of our printed piece. When I'm creating a newsletter or a letterhead or a brochure, or in this case, a business card, I am going to set my file up to be the exact size of my end product. Here, it's a business card, three and a half inches wide, two inches high. The trim size is when I print this final piece, it gets trimmed down to the finished size. You always want to create your file size to the trim size, and you'll see why when we get further in and discuss crop marks. So the trim size is always the size of the finished piece. That's what we create our file to. Our bleed is actually adding additional space beyond the edge of our file and not actually making our document larger, but we actually set up a bleed setting that goes and extends beyond the trim size of our document. And anything that touches the edge here in terms of color or imagery or background we need to bleed off the edge so that when this trims, we don't actually get any paper edge showing. So this is actually providing like a safety. Now, bleed is in addition to the trim size. And I'm gonna show you how to set that up because I don't wanna make my three and a half by two inch business card larger. I set it up to the actual trim size and then I add the bleed settings in. It does not change the size of the document. It simply adds a space beyond the size of my document, which is what we call the trim size, so that we can extend this content beyond the edge so it can get trimmed off. So typically, we set this up in the document setup. Now here, I'm showing you this in InDesign. When you set up a document and you go into the file menu and choose new document, you can set up your sizes, your number of pages that you'd like in the document, your margins, and then under the bleed and slug, you can set your bleed. If you forget to set the bleed, you can always go back into the file menu under document setup and add the bleed later. Typically, when we're dealing with a bleed, unless otherwise specified, it is an eighth of an inch or 0.125. Now you'll notice that this does not change the overall page size of my document. This goes beyond the page size, beyond the trim size, and adds a special margin. The live area is the space within the printed piece that is basically the safe area. We don't want to get anything too close to the edge because when this gets trimmed, we may trim off a little of the important content. This is sometimes referred to as the safe area. And when you see this, this particular live area here is inset a little bit more than the bleed distance. And so when I print this out and I get all these business cards trimmed, 
this will go ahead and make sure that any of my content that's in there doesn't get too close to the edge and therefore gets trimmed off. So the live may also be called the safety. So here, when you're setting up the live area, you again can create a new document and set this, and we understand this as our margins. Now, margins typically set on an eight and a half by 11 page are a half an inch, but I'm doing a business card and a half an inch in from all the edges as a margin seems to be quite excessive. So I'm going to inset this margin area a quarter of an inch. So when I set up a document and I set up my margins to be an eighth of an inch, I get a border inside my trim area or my actual page size showing me where I should keep all my content in, in this safe area that we'd like to say. So here's a quick visual understanding of a layout. We can see our live area indicated by the green. That's where we want to put our content in here, and we don't want to run any important content beyond this live area. Any words, any text, or anything that could interfere with the edge or our spine or our trim area. Our trim is the actual size of our document. So if this were an eight and a half by 11 page, I would set my live area to be indented in from the trim area. And then the bleed is added beyond the edge of the trim. Now, when I were to go to cut this all out after I printed it, all of the bleed would disappear and anything that would touch the trim area, any colored bar, any colored background, any image is then going to extend beyond the bleed. It gets trimmed off so that we don't see any slim little edge of the paper showing where my image or my color doesn't print. Now, we refer to this as a full bleed, where we have bleeds top, bottom, left, and right. If you have a printer at home, most printers at home don't print bleed because it requires you to print larger than your document. So if I have an eight and a half by 11 design that I'm creating, I can't print that full size on my printer at home if it has a bleed because I need to print on larger paper it then needs to get trimmed off. So you'll notice when you try to print something where images or color go to the very edge of your paper and it comes out of your printer, it looks like it stops short of the paper because it's basically printing as much as it can to the edge, but you can't print to the edge. Very few printers that you can get for home use actually print full bleed, unless of course, you print it on a larger piece of paper, say this is an eight and a half by 11 page, and your printer at home prints 11 by 17. Not a problem. You print it out on 11 by 17, the eight and a half by 11 appears here, and then you can trim this down, trimming off that bleed, any of the extra content, to get your eight and a half by 11 page. Now the next set of terminology here is going to be die line, die cut, and die. So we've probably heard those terms before, and what do they actually mean? Well, they refer to the actually cutting out of typically the paper or the cardboard that packages are made out of. And the easiest way to understand this is a cookie cutter. Cookie cutters are actually die cutters. They're metal, they cut out the dough. Same concept works when you're printing out a piece of paper or vinyl or substrate or making a box, it needs to be cut using a die. So how are these created? Well, initially a die line is created and a die line is a template that is then made into the actual die which does the cutting. And they're metal blades, so you create your die line in Illustrator, you send it off to a die maker and they actually create the cookie cutters, or in the printing terms, they actually create the die itself, which are metal blades that will then cut out your paper or your cardboard in that shape. Once that die is made, it is then loaded into a cutter and you run your material through. And just like cookie cutters, the end result turns out to be the shape of your die. 
So when you use a cookie cutter, you are actually using a die to go in and die cut the dough. Well, the same is true when it comes in terms of printing and then die cutting paper or vinyl or cardboard boxes. So here is a typical die line of a cardboard box. You can see this is one piece of material laid out using Illustrator and this is what the entire die line would look like. The die cutter would actually be made to go ahead and cut out the die line and then also kind of not really score but kind of put a little pressure on those fold lines to not cut through it but to give a fold indentation and from that the box or the content would then be assembled showing here on the right hand side. If you want to learn more about how to create die lines, how to indicate folds, how to indicate cuts, and how to build these type of die lines, including more intricate things rather than just flat die lines, things that are curved, things that go around, say, a coffee cup, you can check out my full class on the basics of packaging design, which talks all about die lines, die cutting, and creating your own here on Creative Live. It's not a super long class, there's six lessons, but it's very informative. And the link is there at the bottom of the screen. Crop marks and registration marks. What are they? What are they for? How do they happen? Well here, my business card that I was talking about earlier in this video is ready for print. I've created this in InDesign and I've exported this as a PDF ready to go off for the printer. And I have put on crop marks and registration marks so that the printer can use these to reference when they actually print the file. Crop marks. Well, if I were to print out this business card, which has a bleed, it's actually created artwork beyond the actual trim size, how do you know where to cut this down to get that exact size of three and a half by two inches for the business card? You put in crop marks. And crop marks are a simple way of simply saying, here's where it gets cropped or where it gets trimmed. So crop marks are not something that we go in and we draw manually. You can, but there's a whole lot easier way to do this. In InDesign, when you choose print, you can print the crop marks directly on your printed piece. So when you go into the print dialog box, on the left side, under general and setup, go down to marks and bleeds, you turn on your printer marks, your crop marks, which will occur at the size of your document setup. If your document setup is eight and a half by 11, and you have created a box in the middle of your page, for your business card, the crop marks will appear on the 8.5 by 11 page. Again, always set up your files to the actual finished size of your object or your printed piece. The printer's marks, including the crop marks, will then be generated exactly to the size of your finished piece, the trim size. One thing to note when you do use the print dialog box as well as exporting as a PDF, you'll see that the marks and bleed settings are the same. Turn them on and you will get all these items automatically generated. However, in the lower portion of both the print and the export PDF window, you'll see the bleed and slug area. When you create a bleed on your object or your document, you must go in here and in the print dialog box and the PDF box, you must choose to turn on and actually print that bleed. This does not create the bleed, this just simply allows the bleed area that goes beyond the edge of our trim size to be printed. So, if you do not set up a bleed, you'll never get a bleed beyond the edge of your trim size. If you do set up a bleed, make sure you check that box under the bleed and slug area to use the document bleed settings so that it will actually generate that bleed beyond the edge of your trim size. Registration marks are those little targets that appear on your printed plates. 
and this is part of the printer mark checkboxes, which we just showed you. What are these registration marks really for? Well, the registration marks are to go in and basically register the colors together. Now, the registration marks are part of the list of all the printer marks in your Marks and Bleeds when you go into your print dialog box or your export as PDF dialog box. That's checked automatically. When things print out of register, if I were printing with CMYK in the four colors, you'll see that when the colors print out of register, everything looks slightly blurry. You'll see the registration mark, which is indicated by that target, looks like it's blurry as well. And that means that it is out of register. So when you're having things printed, you want to make sure that all of the colors register exactly in place, hence the registration mark, so that all those crosshairs line up and you get a perfect outcome. So when everything is in register, everything will line up perfectly and all the inks will lay down in perfect register. They won't appear blurry or they won't appear like when two inks come up next to each other, as in this logo, I don't want any paper showing through between the gold and then the black shadow. Now, if things were out of register, I'd see a little white sliver inside there, which would really detract from my final outcome. Registration marks are part of the printing marks that are there in your print and your PDF dialog box. When you check those, you get your crop marks and your registration marks. Now let's talk about resolution. DPI, PPI, and image resolution. DPI stands for the number of dots per inch. And this refers to the number of dots per inch that actually come out of the printer putting down ink to reproduce your image. The higher number of dots per inch means that you will get smaller ink dots and it produces a better quality outcome. Because the ink dots are smaller, it can reproduce finer dots and generally create a nicer looking image. This image that I have here is quite an exaggeration of the dots per inch or the DPI. And I've created this by using this halftone effect. And the halftone effect takes your cyan, your magenta, your yellow, and your black and creates dots out of this so that you can reproduce this and the image then looks like it should. Remember, the higher number of dots per inch, the better quality you get. Now, pixels per inch are something completely different. Pixels per inch are the number of pixels or colored squares that are in your image. And here, when we look at this image, you can see each and every square of color, which makes up my entire image. The higher number of pixels per inch means better quality. And the reason why is because smaller number of pixels will then fit into an inch. Smaller pixels produce finer detail, produce better quality, but also larger file sizes. So let's take a look here at the resolution of an image. So remember, resolution is the number of pixels per inch. So here I have an image opened in Photoshop. And when I draw a selection that is one inch wide, I can count that there's 300 pixels across on this selected area. So 300 pixels per inch, very good detail. When you look at this, you can see in fairly good clarity. Now, interestingly enough, pixels do not have a fixed size. Hence, when we have a low resolution image, we have 72 pixels per inch. Remember, this is the same one inch that is measured. However, lower resolution means you have lower clarity, less pixels per square inch. That means much larger pixels because you're still dealing with one inch of area. But if you recount the number of pixels across this one inch width, you will only have 72. Lower resolution, lower number of pixels per inch. Now, in terms of what do you need as the final outcome, anything with print, you should have at least 300 pixels per inch in your image. Anything for the web or displaying in a light emitting device usually requires much lower resolution files, 72 pixels per inch. Now, you'll hear 
pixels per inch, or PPI, and dots per inch, DPI, used interchangeably. And people do this all the time, even though it's incorrect. And so somebody will say, I need a picture that's 300 DPI. Well, we generally never really think about the number of dots per inch that prints in a printer, only because if we see the print and it looks good, we're not really concerned about how that looks. So people will erroneously use both of these terms, meaning the quality or the resolution of the image. And you'll hear PPI and DPI. They pretty much mean the same thing because nobody's going to talk about the quality of their printer and dots per, ink, dots per inch of ink, but they will most definitely talk about the quality of their image in terms of pixels per inch. So again, these two are used universally. They're incorrectly used, but in most cases, they mean the image resolution. So let's talk about resolution of images as opposed to images that have no resolution. Well, interestingly enough, resolution refers to images that are made up of pixels, which we also call raster images. Vector images, such as artwork made in Illustrator, don't have any resolution component to them whatsoever because they're just simply scalable vector files. They're just simply a shape with a fill. And therefore, we don't have any resolution requirements because we can make these any size we want. Now, one of the most typical ways that we see vectors is fonts. If you're sending an email and you make the font larger or smaller, the font itself doesn't look worse quality when you make it bigger because it's a vector shape and it can be made any size whatsoever without any degradation. Images that are raster based and made of pixels will suffer degradation the larger they get because you have a fixed amount of information that is stretched over a larger area. So here we see pixels or raster based image all made out of pixels and squares of color. That's a fixed number of them in there. So we can only do so much with that. Vector, however, is clean and crisp and be can, scaled, can be scaled to any size whatsoever without any issues. So let's talk about actual resolution versus effective resolution. Actual resolution is the size of the original image. Now, effective resolution is how you use the image in the end. So if I take an image and I place it in InDesign and I make it larger and larger and larger, what is happening is I'm stretching that image over a larger area and that information is being stretched thinner and therefore I'm getting a lower quality image because I am stretching it further and the resolution and the quality is going down. If I take that exact same image and I place it into InDesign and I reduce the image size down, I'm taking the same amount of information and I'm reducing it down, which means the resolution's going up, I'm packing more pixels per inch, and the quality goes up. So when I'm talking about actual resolution versus effective resolution, actual resolution is the way the image is shot versus the way the image is used in the end. I can have a very high quality image that's four by five, but what if I use it in InDesign and I'm trying to make a poster and I use it 24 by 36, the actual resolution may be high resolution, but the effective or the end result may be essentially very low. Something to think about. Now let's talk about other printing terms. Knockout, overprint, and rich black. Knockout is pretty simple. A knockout is when you go and you knock out the color or an image to the paper that it sits on. Generally, when we knock out something, we create a shape or put type on whatever background it's sitting on, and we fill it with white. Well, white doesn't print. If you've ever looked at your printer, you've got four different color inks, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. There is no white ink in there. And white just simply assumes the color of the paper. So if I have a green background and I want the green to go away in the shape of a star, I will create a star that is filled with white and then nothing prints. It essentially knocks out anything below where the star sits. And it seems like nothing happens and it looks white because that's the color of the paper. 
Overprinting is different. Overprinting is when you print colors on top of each other for different effects or to make sure that you get no edges in between objects that print. So like I talked about the logo in a few slides before when we were talking about registration, I wanted the inks to line up perfectly so the shadow of the logo and the gold of the logo didn't print out of register and show a little edge of paper showing through. So overprinting of colors can happen when you have translucent or semi-transparent colors that can then print over other colors or other images and create a different effect. Now usually when we print, black is the last color to print because it overprints on top and therefore doesn't leave any space in between the colors below it and the black to show any of the paper through. Now, overprinting can work in several different ways, but typically when you're doing any type of overprinting and you're going to have this professionally printed, always talk to the printer who's printing because inks come in different types. Some are translucent, some are semi-transparent, and some are opaque. So some inks will hide everything below the ink where it prints, and others may show through. So overprinting can be a bit of a tricky rich black. Well, what is a rich black as opposed to a standard black? Well, if you choose black in your color palette and you apply it to one of the most common things, type, it just simply gives you black. But you'll notice when you print that on your printer, it may not be a really nice saturated black. It may look very close to being black, but it's not super black. It's just a single color black. Well, a rich black is when you combine other colors together, your four color process colors, cyan, magenta, yellow, along with black itself. Rich blacks create a deeper black, but keep in mind that you're also printing multiple inks to get that. So a rich black, and this is just a typical example, is 30% cyan, 30% yellow, 30% magenta, and 100% black. You never want to go in and put 100% of all four colors because your printed piece would come out so saturated and so wet that it would look terrible and it may start to run. So there's different types of rich black too. You can have a warmer black where you bump up the magenta. You can have a cooler black where you bump up the cyan. But this is a typical rich black. And there is no perfect rich black. Other printers will recommend different types of combinations in order to create a rich black. But talk to your printer who is going to be printing your final piece. If you want to do a rich black and you are printing in CMYK, they'll offer you their advice. So this is the difference between a standard black and a rich black, and I tried to best convey what would happen with a single color black that you print out at your home printer, as opposed to a rich black where all those colors are now printing together, forming a more richer saturated black. The standard black is pretty close to black, but it's not actually just all encompassing. It's just got a little bit of, you know, just lack of intensity to it. Rich blacks can look quite interesting. One recommendation is do not use a rich black on type. When you use small type, things can print out of register and your type will look fuzzy because you're printing cyan, magenta, yellow, and black all on small type and the registration could be slightly out and therefore the type could look really fuzzy. We use rich blacks if we're doing a flood of black in the background or we're using something that we want, some rich borders or some rich imagery. Now let's talk about RGB versus CMYK, these color modes. RGB, red, green, blue, versus CMYK, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. Big difference. RGB is the visible spectrum of light made up of red, green, and blue. RGB is called an additive color because as you add the red, the green, and the blue together in equal amounts, you will get, at full intensity, white as a result. RGB is all about visible light. CMYK is all about printing. That is made up of cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. CMYK is subtractive. 
So as you add your cyan, magenta, yellow, and black together, you achieve total blackness. Hence the subtract, you're taking the color away. Now RGB and CMYK are two absolutely opposite color modes and they work exactly opposite of each other. So what happens, RGB is the mode for capturing and emanating light. So if you want to take a picture and display it on a cell phone, a TV, or a monitor, everything is built in RGB. However, we cannot print in RGB because everything is going to be opposite of what CMYK is. So understanding CMYK a little bit better, as opposed to RGB, may be best described when we look at this particular example. You'll notice this entire shape is the entire visible spectrum of light. That's what our eyes see. However, trying to reproduce that in print form, you see that the very small space inside is the CMYK realm, which means that this entire beautiful vision of light this entire spectrum here cannot be completely reproduced anywhere close to what RGB can. Unfortunately, the broad range of RGB just cannot be created using CMYK. So we run into issues with trying to reproduce a beautiful image in RGB when we get into print. And remember, images that are captured in RGB have to be converted to CMYK. And of course, with this conversion, thanks to the use of software, the software converts the RGB to CMYK in its best way possible to get the best looking version of your RGB image. Spot colors. What are spot colors? Why do we use them? Why do we need them? And what are all the issues with them? Well, spot colors, think of them as a single color ink. And spot colors feature a much larger color gamut or color range than anything that we can make out of a combination of our process colors, which are cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. Spot colors create a much more distinct color, and you can also have metallics, fluorescents, neons, and pastels, which are just not capable of being produced using CMYK. The easiest way to think of a spot color is a crayon. You don't take your cyan, magenta, yellow, and black crayons and mix them together in order to create a color. You buy your box of crayons, and if you want cherry red, you pull out your cherry red crayon, which is a single ink in and of itself, and you begin using that crayon. If you use paints and you paint your wall at home or your house or your ceiling, you go to the paint store and you order that paint or that ink and you go home with a single color. That is a spot color. Now yes, they mix these specialized colors together to get the singular color. You don't mix all these colors together. You just simply take that color paint or that crayon and you apply it. So the system that we use most commonly around the world, and there are several different types of systems, but the most common one is the Pantone matching system, commonly referred to as PMS. The Pantone matching system has standardized colors all around the world, and it's not just for printing inks. It's for metal, vinyl, fabric, leather, plastic, and pretty much any way color is represented in your car, in your house, in your clothing, the Pantone matching system has developed this standardized set of colors. Now this standardized set of colors is all indicated by numbers or names. And if you are in America and you would like to print something overseas, you specify that PMS color and you say, I want PMS color 325. And anywhere around the world, that color is standardized and you will get the exact same color. Now, Spot colors are a different set of colors than CMYK colors. Remember, they are a single color. And we're using the Pantone matching system. You'll notice that you'll have the Pantone numbers followed by a letter. Well, the letter is actually the paper that it's printed on. C stands for coated paper, M stands for matte paper, U for uncoated. 
Now this is the exact same color here, in this case Pantone 325. But it looks different simply because when you print it on different surfaces, coated paper, the inks are more vibrant because it's sitting on top of the coating. Matte paper has a little bit more of a dull finish, so the ink kind of sinks into the paper or gets absorbed. Uncoated paper will absorb the ink and it will create a different look and color. These are all the exact same color, same concept of painting. If you paint with you know, a flat paint as opposed to a gloss paint, it will look different. It's the same color. So people inadvertently refer to 325C as being completely different than 325M or 325U. It isn't. It's the exact same color. It is just indicated to make it look like it would best look on coated or uncoated or matte paper. It's the same color. So really, in essence, if you want to specify a spot color, all you have to say is PMS 325, and whatever you print it on, that color is going to be that color. Why would we use a spot color? Well, remember, spot colors offer a much broader range of bright and saturated colors, as well as colors that we can't get anyplace else. Pastels, metallics, things like that, we can't get that. Plus, if I'm trying to print something, and I'm trying to save money, each ink that you put down on your paper is going to cost money. And so if I'm going to print a business card here, I'm going to print this using two spot colors because I only have to pay for two inks. I don't want to pay for cyan, magenta, yellow, and black if I'm not going to use them. So here, I set up this business card to use two Pantone spot colors, 3035 and 142. Do you notice how he didn't put the C or the M or the U after it? Because it doesn't matter. This was actually printed on uncoated paper, so when I would go into my file and I would set this up, I would choose the 3035U to get the best representation on screen. 3035 is just simply the color, no matter what you print it on. How do you get spot colors in Adobe Illustrator? Well, first of all, you don't technically go in and make a spot color. These Pantone spot colors are already created and you simply go into your file, you pick that spot color that is made, and then you use it in your artwork. If you're going in and you're creating or making a spot color, it truly is not a Pantone spot color. They're already pre-made for you, they cannot be edited, and they cannot be created. So in Illustrator, if you go under your window menu and open your swatches, you can then click on the swatches drop-down menu and go to your libraries, open your swatch library, go to your color books, and pull up the Pantone solid color. You'll notice that when the Pantone solid color panel comes up, each one has a little slash in the corner, which means it's a global color and there's a little dot in that slash in the corner which indicates a spot color. Here are the two colors that I used on the business card that I just showed you on the other screen, and these have a U following them simply because that was indicating that I wanted to represent this on uncoated paper. But it doesn't change the color at all. 142 is yellow, and it's the exact same yellow whether you print it on plastic or glass or coated or uncoated or matte paper. Creating spot colors in InDesign. Again, you choose from the list of pre-existing swatch colors. It's a little bit easier to do in InDesign. So in order to open your swatches panel, you go into the window menu, choose your color section, go into swatches, and then you click on the drop-down menu in your swatches panel and just simply say new color swatch. Up comes the new color swatch panel, and in the color mode drop down menu, you can choose from RGB, CMYK, as well as all of the list of the Pantone colors. Here, I choose the color mode Pantone solid coated, and I see the colors there. I click on the color and it adds it to my swatch panel, ready to use in my file. In Photoshop, again, you choose from a list of spot colors, you don't make the spot color. Different way to do this in Photoshop. Go to the bottom of your toolbar where your color picker is and double click on it. You'll open up your first panel here in your color picker and on the right hand side click on your color libraries button. 
From that, you'll open up your color libraries and from the book drop down menu at the top, choose your Pantone solid coated colors, select the color that you like, and click OK. Now, most people assume that when you're talking about Pantone colors, it means a spot color. That is something that we are very used to because Pantone is pretty much the world standard for spot colors. But keep in mind that Pantone makes completely different color systems that are unrelated to spot colors. They also make process colors. They also make conversion colors. So here from the standard list of Pantone colors that you're going to find in InDesign, in Illustrator, and in Photoshop, you'll notice that only some of these are truly spot colors. Yes, Pantone has an entire set of process colors. They're not spot colors, they're process colors. And so the CMYK coded and uncoded is just simply Pantone's way of showing you pre-mixed colors of cyan, magenta, yellow, and black on coded and uncoded paper. Again, not spot colors. They also have a color bridge which converts spot to process so you can see the difference between what a spot color looks like if it's then converted into its closest equivalent in CMYK or for color process. However, the metallics, the pastels, the neons, and the solid colors, those are all spot colors. So don't assume that Pantone is a spot color, even though most people do, because that is the most common reference for it. Pantone makes other colors well beyond spot colors. Now something very interesting, because spot colors are a single ink and they provide a much broader, more saturated range of colors, converting to CMYK can create very different colors. Pantone provides you with, when you purchase the conversion books, which is called the bridge, so the Pantone color bridge, which bridges between the spot color or the solid color to the CMYK equivalent. And here is just a really quick indication that if I choose this pink here, 2064, and I want to print it using four color process, this is the conversion here. Sometimes spot colors are very close to the CMYK equivalent. Sometimes they are very different from there. And remember, metallics, neons, and pastels have no conversion whatsoever to CMYK because there just simply is no way to create those color ranges using CMYK. So how do we actually know what these look like? Well, the only way you can tell a spot color is actually buying the spot color guides or the formula guides directly from Pantone. This is an entire fan deck and they print every single spot color on paper. They do not represent accurately on screen because your screen is RGB. They do not print accurately if you print them out on your printer at home because that's CMYK. The only way to do this is to buy the Pantone color guides. Go to Pantone.com and you can buy the color guides. You'll notice here in this representation, we have the solid coated and uncoated. Why? Because you will have a fan deck with all those colors printed on coated paper, printed on matte paper, printed on uncoated paper. The color bridge is showing you what the spot colors look like on coated, uncoated, and matte paper, as opposed to the CMYK conversion of that as well. Maybe very close, maybe very far away. They also get into CMYK on coated, matte, and uncoated, and then their metallics and their Pantone, or their metallics, their neon colors, their pastels, and a huge range. So you will end up buying lots and lots and lots of color guides. The only way to accurately see them is to buy the color guide and see that spot color printed on the paper that you end up printing on in the end. Now, keep in mind when you're printing spot colors, no CMYK can truly print the spot colors. Some spot colors can get very close to representing in CMYK, and that's why you use the Pantone color bridge to see what your spot color looks like and to see what the CMYK printed equivalent looks like. Now, if you're going and you're going to professionally print something, when you go and send it off to your professional printer, they actually order the specific PMS colors that you're going to use in your project. So, like my business card, if I'm gonna have that printed, they would order the ink 
PMS 3035, and they would order the ink PMS 142. They would then put my job on the press, and those two colors would print. Two single pre-mixed spot colors. Just like going to the paint store, and if you're ordering a color for the outside of your house, you order that color, and they give you that ink, they give you that paint, and you simply apply it. You do not apply cyan, magenta, yellow, and black to get that color. Now remember, some people try to print spot colors at home. Well, you can't. You cannot accurately print a spot color because a spot color is a single ink. And several times people have asked me, well, wouldn't it be great you know, if they made a printer that prints spot colors? Well, you realize that you would need a ink cartridge for every single spot color. Now here's something interesting. Cyan, magenta, yellow, and black are technically spot colors because they're single inks. So, cyan, single spot color, magenta, single spot color, yellow, and black. And of course, the most commonly used spot color ever is black. Single ink, one color, mix nothing, and you get it. So again, you're not going to get a spot color printer at home. It would require thousands of ink cartridges and probably take up your entire house to do it. So moving on to folding dummies and mock-ups. What are they for and why do we use them? Well, a folding mock-up is when you have a die line, you print it out, you cut it out of paper or cardboard or whatever your final construction is going to be like, and you put it together so you can have a three-dimensional model. and You can see how it's going to look, where you're going to put your content, how it looks on the shelf, how things are going to read, and which way you need to build the artwork on the panels. Surprisingly enough, when you're creating just this very simple coffee cup, the die line for this coffee cup isn't a rectangle. It's curved because the opening at top is larger than the opening of the bottom. So you always create a folding mock-up of your die lines so you can have a tangible three-dimensional model of what you're looking at and then when you print out your artwork and you place it in the die line, then you'll be able to go in and see exactly what it looks like. Now, if you are dealing in the digital world and you want to do three-dimensional mock-ups of your content without printing them off with the artwork, folding them up, photographing them, Adobe Dimensions allows you to take your artwork in just about any form, JPEG, PNG, Photoshop file, PDF, Illustrator file, and choose from a whole library of basic shapes that you can then go in and you can apply different environments, put different images behind your object, apply different lighting, different textures, different reflections on your surfaces, and then map to each and every available surface of these objects. So here I threw a logo that was done in Illustrator onto my coffee cup. If I wanted to do something on the lid, I could. The coffee cup, I can control the texture of the paper, the reflectiveness, the bounce, my shadow that I have, my lighting, and it's pretty awesome. So look for a video on that coming soon. I love Adobe Dimensions because of all the crazy cool things you can do to it. It's a very simple program and it's part of your Adobe subscription. And there we have it, folks. So now we understand what live trim and bleed is what a die line is and what a die cut and how to make them, overprinting, knocking out colors, understanding RGB, spot colors, CMYK, rich black, resolution, printer's marks. So I hope this was really informative. Again, just very basic terminology, and hopefully this helps you understand when somebody says something, you'll know exactly what they're talking about. Check out my other videos and subscribe, and we'll see you next time for more fantastic content.